Hello folks and welcome back to Let's Play The Lurking Horror. I'm the Mysterious JG and I just wanted to double check um, that we have a certain item in our inventory before we continue our spooky adventure. And we are carrying a flashlight, a master key, a two liter bottle of classic coke, a smooth stone, and an assignment. A smooth stone, eh? I'll push our way back into the computer center. Look at assignment. I don't know the word lock. Oops, look. Laser printed on creamy bond paper. This assignment is due tomorrow. It's from your freshman course in the classics and the modern idiom, better known as 21014. It reads in part 20 pages on modern analogs of xenophons and a. And I, I can't pronounce this. Anabasis. You're not sure whether this refers to the movie The Warriors or Alien, but this is the last assignment you need to complete in this course this term. You wonder, yet again, why a technical school requires you to endure this sort of stuff. And I was about to say, yeah, that's the, that's the story that The Warriors was sort of based on, but not really. I mean, I actually read that um, in translation, because I was curious and I was looking for things to read on my Kindle. Um... And, you know, other than the very general notion that it's about guys trying to get back home, really not a whole hell of a lot going on in the Warriors that is similar. Because this is a much longer term thing. This thing has them, they are, they're hiring people. Uh, I mean, it's not really about, other than, there's a very small number of individual characters. It's one of, it's like, it's a bit like RTK. There's like huge armies and battles and stuff, but by and large, it's just a description of events happening. There's not a lot of personal stuff. But um, that was the comic book that the kid in the Warriors book was reading, and then the movie really took a lot of liberties with the Warrior book, the Warriors book anyway. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Pretty, uh, pretty thin connection actually, ultimately between the Warriors movie and that you know Xenophon's story. Uh, but at any rate. I didn't know Alien was supposed to be about that, too. <laughs> so we're going to drop the assignment because, as far as I know it, it's never useful. We don't have to complete the assignment to win the game. As a matter of fact, there's no way to complete the assignment. The game ends when you defeat the Lurking Horror. And uh, you have to defeat the Lurking Horror. And I'm just pretty sure there's nothing that you do where you ever actually complete this assignment. So we're back out in Smith Street. Let's go east. Smith Street runs west towards the computer center here. To the south is a dilapidated gray wooden building. The street is an impassable sea of blowing and drifting snow. Bitter, bone-cracking cold assaults you continuously. The temperatures and the blizzard conditions are both horrible south. You push your way into the comparative warmth of the laboratory. It is pitch black. Turn on flashlight. The flashlight clicks on. Temporary lab. This is a laboratory of some sort. It takes up most of the building on this level. And all the interior walls have been knocked down. One reason these temporary buildings are still here is their flexibility. No one cares if they get more or less destroyed. A stairway leads down, and a door leads north. There is a metal flask here. Get flask. Down. Temporary basement. During the Second World War, some temporary buildings were built to house war-related research. Naturally, these buildings, though flimsy and ugly, are still around. This is the basement of one of them. To the, ba the basement extends west, a stairway leads up, and a large passage is to the east. There's a pair of electrician's gloves and a crowbar here. Get all. They're all taken. We go east, dead storage. This is a storage room. It contains an incredible assemblage of discarded junk. Some of it is so old and moldering that you can't be sure where one bit of junk stops and the next begins. It's piled to the ceiling on ancient, rotting pallets. You can't even see the east wall. West, temporary basement, west, basement. Bare concrete walls line a wide corridor leading east and west. An elevator and call button are to the south. Stairs also lead out for the energetic. From floor to ceiling run wire channels and steam pipes. Turn off flashlight. The flashlight clicks off. And I think we're still safe. We really don't want to waste turns of that flashlight. The flashlight batteries are basically the limiting factor of the game. It's, uh, you got plenty of, co a two liter bottle of coke is plenty to get you through the night in this game. Oh, I haven't really explained that, have I? Save. Sleep. You try to sleep, but you can't relax. All right, never mind. Uh, when I start feeling sleepy, I will need to save and sleep so you guys can see what happens. 
West, Arrow Basement. This basement level room is made up of smooth, damp-seeming concrete. Fluorescent lights cast harsh shadows. To the west is a stairway, and to the east the basement area continues. There's a forklift here. Get on forklift. This is silly that we can just hop onto a forklift and use it. Turn on forklift. The forklift sputters to life. Turn. And I, apparently it doesn't have a look at forklift, actually. It should have lights on it. This is a rusty, wheezy, this is a rusty and wheezing old forklift. It looks like you can control it fairly easily, though. East, basement on the forklift. East, temporary basement on the forklift. East, it is pitch black. Turn on flashlight. Turn on your flashlight. Dead storage on the forklift. This is storage room. It contains a credible sandwich of discarded junk. Move junk. You have a little trouble. You have a little trouble using the forklift, but it's not really all that hard. You start clearing the junk, moving it around, and trying to create a passage again. You continue moving junk, becoming more proficient with the forklift again. Continue moving junk, becoming more proficient again. You've built a fairly narrow, albeit about one forklift wide, path through the junk. You can see an opening into a further storage room beyond this one. East, ancient storage on the forklift. What's deader than dead storage? That's what's in this room. Most of the contents have collapsed or rusted back to the primordial ooze. There's a mold growing on some of the unidentifiable piles. Stagnant puddles of water pollute the floor. You can now believe how old some of these foundations are said to be. There's a closed, disused-looking manhole here. Open manhole. You can't reach the manhole from within the forklift. Okay, get off forklift. Turn off flashlight? Is there light in here? There shouldn't be. Ah, the flashlight clicks off, leaving you in the dark. Not alone, however. One should never assume the dark is safe. Something just grabbed you from behind and dragged you off into its lair. You have died. Crap. I didn't think that just turning off the flashlight would instantly kill us. So... For anybody who isn't watching the screen, I'm just quick uh, going through the forklift bit again. Because it does make me easy or nervous to um, keep the. Uh... Okay, we're going to save our game. Makes me nervous to keep the flashlight on when I. unless I know what's needed. Get off forklift. Open manhole. The only way would seem to be to remove the manhole cover. Remove manhole cover. And I'm going to cut to the chase here with crowbar. You lever the manhole cover aside, and crusted dirt falls into the dark, partly obstructed hole below. Down. You push your way through cobwebs, damp fungus, and other obstructions. Brick tunnel. This is an ancient tunnel constructed of rough mortared bricks and stones. A slippery and almost invisible set of handhold leads up. The tunnel continues a long way north and south from here. Okay. Let's try going south first. You make your way along the long tunnel. Cinder block tunnel. This is a tunnel whose walls are cinder block with a concrete floor and ceiling. A metal ladder leads up to a closed metal plate in the ceiling. And the tunnel continues north where the cinder block walls become thick brick. Open plate. It lifts a few inches, but then hits something and goes no further. Okay, so whatever is above us is blocking it. North and north again, and we are now in renovated cave. You're in a huge cave-like construction. A path leads down to a floor partly covered with rough concrete. The walls and ceilings are high and reinforced with beams of wood, iron, and steel. In the center of the floor, you can see a large flat slab of granite. The only exit is behind you to the south. What about down? If we go down, because it looks, it seems like, yeah, path leads down. Before the altar, you're at the bottom of the cave. The huge slab of granite in the center is a sort of altar. Oh, boy. Under the school, and we're finding an altar. It is carved with strange and disturbing symbols, the largest of which looks very familiar. Some of the symbols are obscured by rusty red stains. Rusty red stains, huh? Nearby is an iron plate set in the concrete of the floor. Lying to one side of the altar... Stone is a sharp, thin-bladed knife. Get knife. Look at symbol. 
Oops, symbol. Oops, symbol. Is my M key getting sticky? What symbol do you mean? The inside symbol or the carved symbol? Carved. The symbol on close examination appears to have been carved in the smooth stone, perhaps with a claw. The symbol seems just as odd as before. So there's an iron plate, open plate. You slide open the panel, revealing a dark pit below. Immediately there is a response from below. A low, guttural, groaning and snarling issues from the opening. Oh. Maybe we shouldn't have done this. Down. You can't go that way. A low, guttural, groaning and snarling issues from the opening. Drop stone in opening. The sounds from below increase in intensity, and we no longer have the stone. Okay, well, we need the stone, so let's restore. Let's close the, uh, I don't even remember what it was. It was a metal something or other panel. Close panel? You close the panel. You no longer hear the noise as much to relief. Up south west, sorry. South, north, up. Wasted a lot of turns there. Close panel. Up, south, up. West, west, west. Turn off flashlight. Excellent. So we've been wandering around in the basement a bit. We really haven't found... Uh, our way to the alchemy building, though. We go west from the arrow basement. And look here again. Basement is room is smooth, damp, seeming concrete. Stairway is with stairway to the west, to the east, the basement. So we can go west and stairway. A dimly lit stairway leads up and down from here. A corridor continues east. Let's go up. Arrow lobby. This is the lobby of the aeronautical engineering building. Stairs lead down, and a corridor leads south towards the main building. South. Infinite Corridor. The so-called Infinite Corridor. If only we had a spell to remove the purple lettering that says infinite so it's finite. The so-called Infinite Corridor runs from east to west in the main campus building. This is the west end. Side corridors lead north and south, and a set of doors leads west into the Howling Blizzard. There is a plastic container here. There is a largish machine being operated down the hall to the east. Another spot where we want to save our game, folks. Let's get the container. Let's look at the container. It's a plain plastic container with something written on it. The plastic container is closed. God damn it! Read the writing. Why am I? Why is it taking like eight commands? I don't know the word writing. Read container. Froba's Magic Floor Wax and Dessert Topping. <laughs> Alright, so let's head east. Infinite Corridor. The so-called Infinite Corridor runs from east to west in the main campus building. The corridor extends both ways from here. Many closed and locked offices are to the north and south. A maintenance man is here writing a floor wax, sir. Man, hello. He replies in a language you do not recognize. The words are guttural and jarring. <sighs> oh... Look, man. Use prepositions instead. Look at man. He looks tired, bored, almost zombie-like. East. In a deft maneuver, the maintenance man steers the floor waxer into your path, blocking your advance. Wait. The floor waxer waxes away to the east. East. The so-called infinite corridor runs from east to west in the main campus building. The corridor extends both ways from here. A stairway leads up, and a door leads out to the great court. A maintenance man is here riding a floor waxer. There is a wall socket on one wall, and a heavy-duty power cord is plugged into it. The cord leads to a large floor waxer. Full cord. You pull at the power cord, but it won't come loose. Inventory. We got electrician's gloves on. Let's wear gloves. Maybe that will give us more grip. You put on the gloves. They're a little big, but not really such a bad fit at all. Pull cord. You pull at the power cord, but it won't come loose. The floor waxer waxes away to the east. Cut cord with knife. 
You hit the cord with a knife, but it has no effect. East. Infinite Corridor. The so-called Infinite Corridor runs from east and west in the main campus. The corridor extends both ways from here. Many closed and locked offices are to the north and south, so you can't go into them. A maintenance man is here riding a floor waxer. There is a glass-fronted emergency cabinet here. Look at cabinet. It's one of those little cabinets you see in institutional buildings that usually contains a fire hose and a fire axe. This one seems to ha only have an axe. It has a transparent window. There is writing on the cabinet. Read cabinet. In case of emergency, break glass. Break. Oh, hold on. Save. Remove gloves. Break glass. You hit the gloves with your hands, but you can't hit hard enough to break it. You might cut yourself on the glass. So let's uh, restore. Still wearing the gloves if we break the glass. Wearing the heavy gloves, you confidently smash the glass with a blow of your hands. The floor waxer waxes away to the east. I think you could do that with the crowbar as well. Get axe. Taken. Cut cord. What do you want to cut the cord with? Axe. The axe crashes against the floor and the power cord severs. The whine of the floor waxer slows and the maintenance man jerks to alertness. Look at man. The maintenance man is very annoyed with you. The maintenance man, growling foul-sounding imprecations, descends in the floor waxer and heads towards you. Man, stop. He's not here, but he might be soon. The maintenance man lurches towards you with surprising speed. Man, stop. I don't understand. What are you referring to? Hit man with axe. I mean, he's obviously some kind of demon. He's speaking weird guttural language. The fire axe chops into his chest where it sticks. Ed Ames would be proud. The force of the blow staggers him a bit. He looks down at the axe with a certain perplexity, then pulls it free, the wound making a sickening sucking sound. The maintenance man stares with maniacal intensity at your throat. Uh, wait. 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 <laughs> the maintenance man stares with maniacal intensity at your throat. He grabs you by the throat and lifts you off the ground with one hand. The hand feels very cold. Just as you expire, you realize you have never seen him blink. And now we've got 20 out of 100, which means we are graded as a junior. But let's restore. We're going to do pretty much the same things. Except now we're going to open the container. You pull off the seal and open the container, revealing a smelly, viscous liquid. The floor waxer waxes away to the east. Pour liquid on floor. It pours out and spreads like ants at a picnic. The floor is now covered from wall to wall with slippery floor wax. Cut cord with axe. You aren't holding the fire axe. Break glass. Get axe. Cut cord with axe. The axe crashes against the floor and the power cord severs. The wine of the floor wax or slows and the maintenance man jerks to alertness. Wait. Maintenance man, growling, foul-sounding imprecations, descends from the floor waxer and head towards you. Wait. The maintenance man lurches towards you with surprising speed. Just as he is about to grab you, he slips on the wax. His hand whips by, inches from your throat, and he drops to the floor, screaming in frustration. Wait. The maintenance man continues slipping, falling, standing, and so on. He reminds you of a badly made wind-up toy. Wait. You get the same message. East. You slip and slide on the wax. It's like walking on wet ice. You can barely keep upright, but it's worse for the maintenance man. His gait is so jerky that each time he takes a step, he falls. His persistence is impressive, but you slip, literally, by before he can grab you. Infinite Corridor. The so-called Infinite Corridor runs from east to west in the main campus building. This is the east end. The corridor branches north and south from here. A disabled floor waxer looms nearby. The maintenance man continues slipping, falling, standing, and so on. He reminds you of a badly made wind-up toy. Wait. We get the same message about the maintenance man. Wait. The maintenance man appears to shorten and almost dissolve. There is a great commotion, as though he is undergoing a convulsion of some sort, and then he appears to explode into a crowd of small squealing creatures. These, seeing you, scuttle off in the opposite direction and disappear. Save. Holy crap. Okay. So. Our term paper was replaced with some kind of, like, you know, Lovecraftian horror stuff. And that didn't seem too cool. But then, we encountered, well, we found uh, some kind of sacrificial altar with rusty red liquid and a knife under the school. That doesn't seem too good either. 
But really things for me pick up a bit when uh, you go into like a school building at night and there's a guy like waxing the floors. Because it is supposed to be the middle of the night here. Which makes it extra spooky. And uh, the maintenance man, I mean, he won't let you buy. So you admittedly take a pretty harsh step when you cut the, the power cord on uh, the floor waxer with an axe. You can't win the game without doing that. You need to. He will keep stopping you from proceeding down the corridor. You need to get there. But when this happens, he basically comes and tries to kill you with his bare hands. And uh, when you try to hit him with an axe, uh, he can pull the axe free from and and his body reseals. And when finally you render him helpless, uh, his body is destroyed and turns into small squiggling creatures. I think at this point. It would really be nice if the text parts are allowed us to go back to the hacker and have a little discussion about what's been going on at school. I just had a really random thought. I don't know why this came to me now, but what is our gender? I mean, I know we're a college student. You're wide awake and are in good health. Yeah. Doesn't tell us. Yeah, no, that was, the, that was one of the nice things about the old Infocom text games is... um. With a few exceptions, you usually kind of got to, what was it, agent cop, ageless, genderless, adventure person, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's no particular reason this couldn't be a girl doing this. I just, uh, I don't know why that just popped into my head now. I guess because I was thinking of going and talking to the hacker and trying to actually get another person involved. Um, whatever. Also, on this topic of these old... Uh, text games, is it just me or is it weird that in this age where suddenly indie games are, are quote, cool, I mean, I put cool in quotes, there's, I mean, amongst people who are totally into video games, indie games are kind of cool. There's still a lot of people for whom video games are kind of like, you know, I'll play Madden and uh, SOCOM sometimes, but mostly I'm out there playing football, you know, whatever. No problem with people who want to do that, I'm just saying. Uh, indie games are so big now, and you've got, like, Bobo played this game with really minimalist graphics that was supposed to be all about like mood and tension and realistic dialogue and and I saw uh, Grimith had played some game where it was a big deal that you were only allowed to play through once and it was like supposed to be really hard to, to play through a second time so your decisions really mattered and really stick and it's about like the end of the world and how are you going to spend your final moments and whatever but they, they had these really cheap I mean it looks like Terrence and Philip off South Park level of graphics and I think what's supposed to be cool about it is that the people who are into this are like, oh, well, if you want flashy graphics, that's fine. These games, it's not about the graphics. It's about the story. It's about making you think it's about a new gameplay experience. I'm like, man, you know, why aren't text games having a resurgence then? And then I realized. You know how everyone got all excited about the Trilby games? And by everyone, I mean a small corner of the Internet. Because you get to go around and you solve puzzles and the graphics are really minimalist, but it's scary and there's mood and blah, blah, blah. But there's really no puzzles. I mean, there's a very small number of puzzles baked into a game. Infogom games could be like this too, actually. There's not really... Like, if you just num number and lay out the puzzles to be solved in most of the Zork games, there's not that many. But there's way more than in any of these Trilby games. And I was just, I was thinking, like, if if the primitive graphics don't bother anybody, and it's either kind of retro hip, or it's just, it's cool that it's not about the graphics anymore, man. I would think that these games, that like the indie game guys, would be making a bunch of text games. Maybe I'm wrong, and there's a bunch of that happening. And if you're aware of them, let me know. But no, it seems like they're only willing to step back so far. The Infocom slogan at one point was like, "We have the most powerful graphics card of all: your imagination." That didn't really work out for them too well in the long run, but still. <laughs> I don't know, I just got off on a bit of a tangent. I guess I get off on tangents sometimes when we murder um, maintenance men working their floor waxers. Anyway, we can't go east. Oh, we must already be at the end of the hallway. Well, let's try going south. Chemistry building. This corridor is lined with closed dark offices. At the south end of the corridor is a door with a light shining behind it. There is something written on the door. Read door. The painted... Painted on the door in calligraphy, indistinguishable from any other door at the tech, is the phrase Department of Alchemy. You always used to wonder what was behind that door. Unlock door with master key. The key fits perfectly in the lock, but the lock doesn't turn. The master key doesn't work on this lock. Knock on door. You knock on the door. The hollow sound reverberates down the hall. You sort of wish you'd knocked more softly. Wait. 
The door opens part way, revealing a professional man in a white lab coat. He smiles. Oh, maybe this guy can have like a spooky voice. He's come. Kind of, uh, he's an alchemist, so he's probably pretty like. Hmm. Well, you know what? He's an alchemist, but I'll give him spooky voice. Good evening. I don't get many visitors this late. You're not one of my students, are you? He ushers you into the room without waiting for an answer, closing the door behind you. Department of Alchemy. This office is clinically clean, shiny, and modern. It looks like something out of a science fiction movie. A closed door to the north leads back into the corridor, and an archway opens at the south. Taped to the wall, taped to the wall to the right of the archway is a sign-up sheet. The professor is here. Look at sheet. This appears to be a sign-up sheet for the lab. Strangely, although a few daytime segments are used, almost all of the nighttime ones are. <laughs> it's an alchemy lab, folks. Most seem to have been taken by two different people, the professor and another, presumably one of his graduate students. The name of the graduate student is oddly familiar. The professor gazes at you in a bored and distracted way. Look at professor. The man looks like a professor. He's wearing a white lab coat, rather rather stained with chemicals, and a GUE tech glass ring. He watches you with an ambiguously predatory air. The professor continues the case at you in a bored and distracted way. South. The professor stops you, not too gently. Sorry, he says, although he doesn't sound too sorry. There are very delicate experiments going on in the lab. You might hurt something. All you can see before he guides you away from the archway is a great deal of odd apparatus and equipment. The professor continues to gaze at you in a bored and distracted way. Professor, hello. The professor looks at you in much the way a cat looks at a mouse. Suddenly you remember why the graduate student's name was familiar. He was a missing student until his body was found smashed and broken at the base of the tallest building on campus. The professor continues to gaze at you in a bored and distracted way. North. The alchemy department door is closed. The professor continues to gaze at you. Open door. Okay, the alchemy department door is now open. The professor gazes at you in a bored and distracted way. Professor. Goodbye. I don't know the word goodbye. Professor, bye. I don't know the word bye. North. The chemist. The door closes behind you. Chemistry building. North. Infinite corridor. Disabled floor waxer looms nearby. Search. Waxer. There is nothing there. North. Fruits and nuts. This is the central corridor of the nutrition building. The main building is south, and a stairway leads down. Down cluttered passage. This cluttered passage leads southeast. It is full of apparently discarded electronic equipment, old rusty file cabinets, and other detritus. A stairway also leads up. Up. Oh, there's my uh, wallpaper instead of the game. Up. Fruits and nuts down southeast. Brown basement. This is where we want to be. This is a cluttered basement below the Brown Building. Discarded equipment nearby blocks an already narrow hallway that terminates in a stairway leading up. The passage itself continues northwest. There's a pair of rubber boots here. Get boots. Wear boots. Snug, but okay. Let's head up the stairs. Brown Building. What can Brown Building do for you? This is the lobby of the Brown Building, an 18-story skyscraper which houses the Meteorology Department and other outposts of the Earth Sciences. The elevator is out of order, but a long stairway leads up to the roof, and another leads down to the basement. A revolving door leads out into the night. Where the night people are. So basically, it's just like a totally vertical building. There's staircases leading up. There's no description of anything in any direction, except for an exit out. So let's apparently just climb 18 flights of stairs by pressing U and enter. Top floor. This is the top of the stairway. A door leads out to the roof here, and you can hear the wind blowing beyond. There's a sign on the door. Read sign. It says, no admittance. In smaller handwritten letters below, it says, this means you. And below that, in different handwriting, it says, who, me? You are beginning to tire. Save. Slot two. Sleep. You've been up for a long time, and it was turning into an all-nighter. You can use the rest. You stretch out as best you can. You toss and turn fitfully, sleeping only in snatches. You are, after all, at the roof access of a skyscraper. You don't really have a bed here. You dream of standing on the roof of the brown building, looking down at the ground. You lose your balance. Your dream ends, and another begins. Something clawed and fain grabs you, and you try to wake. But you already are. You have died. Something cloud and fine grabs you and you try to wake, but you already are. Yeah, see, that's not pleasant. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so our score is now 25 out of 100, and we are in the class of junior. We're also at 30 minute mark, so we'll call it a video. When we come back, folks, um, we dealt with some kind of like demonic, uh, yeah, I'm pulling up all sorts of stuff you weren't meant to see. We dealt with some kind of like demonic uh, floor wax guy, and we took him out and got to the alchemy lab. I didn't even try to talk to the professor in the alchemy lab about my assignment, because I'm pretty sure I can't figure out a way in the text parser to make that work. Uh, but it's obvious that something kind of unpleasant is going on there because this professor and one of his graduate students have been doing lots of stuff late at night and the graduate student apparently was found mangled, horribly mangled in a way nobody had ever seen before at the bottom of the world, at the campus's tallest building. In other words, a grad student who was working with this professor climbed to the top of a building and jumped off and killed himself and the professor is continuing his work. And meanwhile, students are disappearing and maintenance men are becoming satanic fiends. So I'm not sure that this professor is a very nice guy. Regardless, we're calling it a video here. When we come back, we're now uh, right outside of uh, the roof access of the building where the student, grad student, jumped off and killed himself. So does this mean that we're going to find something related to that student? It's hard to say, folks. But it'll be a little easier to say next time. I'm the Mysterious JG. I want to thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.